sounds excellent. I can see that. Okay, so I think I should introduce our speaker. <laughs> so uh, today's speaker is Stepan Prust, and I've, I've not, I have to admit that I just met him like two minutes ago. And so I didn't realize that he was, uh, that he was here on campus. He actually is based in, in, uh, in New Zealand, as you can see from his title slide here. But he's co-sponsored by Rasmus Nielsen, and he spent some time here, but, but I just haven't had a chance to, to meet him quite yet. But he's in the final year of his PhD, uh, and, uh, and I guess he's going to be telling us about his, his PhD work no. here. You're not. You're going to be telling us about something else. The one, the one statement that I want to make, though, is that I think Rory would have liked me to point this out, that he showed up wearing an all-blacks jersey, and Rory actually contemplated trying to get the whole group to mob him. <laughs> this is this ru it's the rugby colors for New Zealand, which Rory has a, a passionate distaste for. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. That's a terrible introduction. No <laughs> But you, you have the floor. It's the most unique I ever had. <laughs> okay. So, uh, like I've been introduced to, I'm in my final year of PhD, but uh, as everyone knows in science, it always takes longer. I didn't even have the data yet to work on my PhD, but I'm pretty sure I will finish soon. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about some research I've done besides my PhD and also some research that I should have published probably five years ago, but it's still fun, hopefully. Uh, before I came to New Zealand, I worked at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology uh, on ancient DNA with Michio Faita for about two years. So that's why I'm going to talk about ancient DNA. I thought I'd give you a, a broad overview of uh, the basics of ancient DNA and then a little bit of the techniques that we can use. I included a lot of new things here because like in the last couple of years uh, there was a lot of research, a lot of new techniques so I hope it's going to be in of interest and then I have two studies of mine that I want to present and it's basically just to give you an idea of how we can use ancient DNA and inferences of uh, paleontological, ecological experiences to understand current and future climate change. And uh, the first one is uh, losing ground, which is basically on uh, the response of uh, Arctic small mammals, the collared lemming and the narrow skulled wolf, on climate change in the past 25,000 years. And the last one is not strictly Arctic. Uh, I still put it in here. It's basically on shrews and how shrews uh, react to climate change in the last, uh, again, 25,000 years. But here we also have a morphological analysis and see how they adapted to different environments. And one of the species that we work on is currently living only in Siberia, in the very cold areas, and is living in the southern Arctic regions. So I thought it might be interesting to include it. I tried to uh, delete all the technical stuff and just give you really a nice colorful, so lots of colorful pictures, uh, idea of what we can use uh, past inference to better understand uh, predictions in the future. So just very generally what is ancient DNA, we've probably heard it a thousand times. Uh, it's either subfossil remains that are usually a couple of thousand to a couple of hundred thousand years uh, old. We have trustful uh, sequences up to 500,000 and then under very circumstance, very, very good uh, conditions like in Greenland you can go older, but usually, in general, I wouldn't really trust anything older than 500,000 years because of preservation and everything. And then we have museum specimens which are a few tens, hundreds of years old. Usually in forensics they say everything is ancient DNA that is older than 75 years. Uh, we call museum specimens even if it's like 20 or 30 but it was stored under certain circumstances and interestingly sometimes it's way easier to extract and amplify DNA from fossils that are let's say 100,000 years old than it is for 30 year old museum specimens because they like to treat them with chemicals and all these things that are really pain. The DNA sources that we work mostly on are bones and teeth. It's basically because it's a hard structure. It preserves uh, DNA quite well. 
uh, you can use dried skin, so you can even do mummies. You can uh, use hair. Hair has been quite common uh, with uh, especially genome data now. The reason why hair is actually quite uh, good is that there's a very low amount of contamination, and I will talk about the contamination issue a little bit later, but keep in mind that hair is really much lower contamination than all the other sources. And then there are other, not so often used ones, that are actually quite fun, is you can extract DNA from soil, even if it's 10,000 years, 20,000 years old, and then you can the, uh, extract DNA from eggshells, which you can do in New Zealand on like all the moa eggshells and everything. It's again like hair, it has a really low amount of contamination in it, so it's actually a quite good source. And then you can have preserved tissue, either in like museums or uh, permafrost or some samples like that. The one problem we usually have is uh, we don't have a good method to not destroy the bone when we uh, amplify or extract the DNA. So going to museums is usually a little bit tricky. Uh, for the Lemming project that I will present, I wrote a uh, letter to a professor in Ekaterinburg in Russia that I've never seen before. I wrote him a letter and said I want 200 Lemming bones and you will never ever get them back. Yeah. And surprisingly, he said yes. I have no idea why. <laughs> and he doesn't drink vodka, so... <laughs> he's not Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I met him there, so at least he's leaving here. Okay, the markers that we use change quite drastically. If I would have given this talk on my last talks a couple of years ago, I would say we use mitochondrial DNA. Fragments of mitochondrial DNA. That's basically because there's thousands of copies in it and so that's the like the molecule that you find the most that is the easiest to extract but it changed it changed drastically we're now usually going for complete mitochondrial genomes which uh, just three four years ago would have been a project on its own to just get one and we now can do a hundred if we want to and then we now also use uh, Y-chromosome DNA, which is a little bit more tricky. There's now a lot of influx of uh, nuclear DNA research, and then now emerging very fast is uh, complete genomes. And uh, I thought about talking about one of the uh, complete genome study on uh, New Zealand eagle that we do, but I couldn't fit it somehow into the Arctic picture. There was no connection, so no eagle. Okay, there are two main problems uh, working on ancient DNA that make our life really, really difficult and probably a little bit shorter with all the stress. <laughs> <laughs> Is DNA gets damaged, and that's happened very, very soon. It's happened just a couple of hours afterwards but it's increasing over time. And this is a very old plot, but what you basically see is that about 10,000 years old samples, there's probably not a single molecule in it that is not damaged. We know now really, really well what the most prominent uh, or the most common damages are. It's on the one hand the strength breaks, so it's uh, a hydrolytic damage here that causes the DNA to fragment, and I will show a picture pretty soon. And the most well-studied one is actually the deamination. So it's uh, the removal of this uh, NH2 group here from the cytosine. And what it does, if you do a PCR then, the PCR will think it's a uracil instead of a cytosine. So it will incorporate the wrong base. And there's really has been a lot of research on this uh, damage and it's actually quite a really interesting one. What you see, so this is uh, your DNA fragment. This is the five prime end, this is the three prime end. And imagine whatever you want in between. What you can see, the colors are the different uh, bases. The red one is uh, T and T is A and you see that within the first four or five bases of uh, typical ancient 
DNA fragment, there is a high increase in frequency of this uh, T and a high increase of frequency of uh, the A on the three prime end, which is basically just a reverse complement. And this is this deamination damage. The nice thing about it is that we can actually use it to prove that the DNA that we extracted is actually uh, ancient. So I use this example. This is uh, ancient DNA of uh, modern humans, the first settlers of New Zealand. And you see really nice, the whole uh, higher frequency at the beginning of the fragments. And then <coughs> this one is from Musa. It's also an uh, island in the Pacific where we tried to get samples from. We extracted, we used all the new techniques, and we were able to assemble a full mitochondrial genome. And everyone just had like signs all over, were pretty excited. We did the haplotype uh, assignment and found out it's European. <laughs> it was actually mostly common in Austria, and I'm from Austria, but it wasn't me. I never touched it. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, okay, we have the sample, we know it's 3,000 years old, we know there's no chance that an Austrian or even any European could have been uh, to the Pacific at that point in time, so we don't trust it. But okay, this one gives the result we want, this one not. We don't trust this one, we trust this one. It's kind of a stupid non-scientific approach, so we thought about uh, different ways, and there is a really good paper from Sawyer, it's also from the Max Planck, where they uh, worked on the different damage pattern and found that there's actually a temporal uh, temporal pattern that you find is so this is the time is 50,000 years 20 years and you see an increase in the C to T change and so we said okay let's take a look on that one this one was excavated about 30 years ago so we would expect it to be around here somewhere which is usually 0.05 and we found 0 0.04. So based on this one, we can say, okay, there is no damage pattern that we would expect. So this one is contamination and this one is real. That's actually quite neat. It's just uh, been published recently. The other problem that I said is uh, the length of the fragment, which can be really tricky. So this here are four different extracts of, of modern humans, again from New Zealand. And what you see is that most of the fragments in here are below 100 base pairs. And then usually they are below 80 base pairs. So the majority is between 20 and 80 base pairs long. If you think about doing a PCR, you have a 20 base pair prime on one end, 20 base pair on the other end. You want to have something in between that is at least interesting, hopefully, or can give you anything. So it should be at least 30, 40 base pairs. If you put it together, you're already at 80. So to make it more interesting, you have to have fragments that are 100, 150, 200 base pairs long. And so, like here, we're missing all of it. But here, we have these ones here, like the really small parts. So we're losing a lot of information and that's one thing that uh, people have been working on. And again, the Max Planck came up with a, a DNA capture method in solution that I will talk about that really made any work on like complete mitochondrial uh, genomes possible because we're now targeting the majority of the fragments and not just the uh, tail of the distribution. The other big issue is uh, contamination. And uh, there are many, many sources. On the one hand, one thing that we found find quite often is the collectors. So usually they don't like to give us DNA because we can match them and then say, okay, it's you. <laughs> Lots of DNA is microorganisms. Like if you think of the Neanderthal genome project, what they sequenced is 99% microorganisms and just 1% and less than 1% sometimes was endogenous Neanderthal DNA. So it makes your life more difficult and more expensive. You have DNA leaching, which can happen. There's been a study and they did uh, go to soil analysis, DNA analysis, and they found sheep DNA on a sheep barn 
uh, down to a minus uh, like 14 meters deep or something. So it's quite a can be a quite big issue. And then there's cross contaminations that is usually at the handling, either when you take the bones and you compare brown bear with cave bear, and then you end up with a cave bear that has both sequences, cave and brown bear, and uh, through DNA extraction or PC, PCR or anything. These ones we can put uh, really a hand on. Uh, these ones we can't, these ones we try, but it seems we can't. And uh, then you have also uh, DNA in chemicals and plastic wear. So even though the companies say that's DNA free, there was a study and they sequenced uh, chicken, pig, human, and cow, I think. So when you work on those species, be really careful. Mm -hmm. One fun story, why I put this one up here, there's been a study like really way back in time from China where they uh, published uh, ancient Chinese human DNA and someone saw the teeth and said like mm, something's wrong, it doesn't look too human. And so they went back, took a look and found out it was actually cave bear teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it to you if you trust the results now or not. <laughs> To avoid contamination, uh, especially through PCR project, uh, pro uh, we work in clean room environments. So at the Max Planck, we had them in uh, the cellar. In New Zealand, we have them in a different building. So you have to go 400 meters through the cold and rain in New Zealand to get to the building. That's probably one thing we always try, if we go there, not to go uh, into a modern lab and then back into here. That's probably why they took it so far away with all the rain and cold. You never want to go back. <laughs> it's quite a lot of work working in here. You see, you have to wear all the protective equipment. There's also high pressure that's putting the DNA down on the floor. And so whenever you come out, you're really tired. You have like the strips and everything of the mask and everything and everyone knows, okay, everything in the clean room. <laughs> They're not sympathetic, they just make fun of you afterwards. <laughs> okay, what I said, the problem that we have is like the small fragments, and uh, Tommy Maricic came up with a really nice solution-based capture that is much cheaper than a ray capture. And what we basically do is, uh, you have uh, modern DNA, so in order to sequence ancient humans in New Zealand, we used my supervisor, <coughs> and so that she's good for something. <laughs> Don't tell her. No, she's fine. All to finish. What you do is uh, you share the DNA. So you do a long range PCR of modern DNA, you share the DNA, and then you ligate it to adapters <coughs> that are biotinulated, and then you have the uh, dynap uh, beads. And what you basically do is uh, this dynap beat, beat to the biotinulated adapters. And then you have this construct here, and you have your ancient DNA extract, uh, extract that you could use uh, barcodes on if you want, uh, and pull them. And then you hybridize for uh, three days. And what it does basically is that, in theory, only the ones that are really close to the target actually hybridize. In theory, I say it because when I first saw this, like, wow, we just end up with 100% of endogenous human mitochondrial DNA. It's not that good. It depends. You can get up to sometimes 30%. So you still have a lot of other things, but at least it makes uh, sequencing a little bit less expensive. And then the other quite big revolution, as in genetics in general, was a high, th high throughput sequencing. We still really love to use the 454, although it's not considered fancy anymore, I think. Uh, it has uh, the read lengths that we need, and especially with the analysis uh, of uh, ancient DNA where you want to see the ends. Remember the damage, we want to know if it's uh, really ancient DNA. We can sequence the whole fragments with this one, whereas the high sec is usually a little bit too small, so we only end up with the beginning or the end. But the high sec has a really high throughput 
it's so much more, so much cheaper if you have bigger projects. So we do some work on HiSec or MySec, but uh, usually we use 444. Okay, and so uh, now it's time to get some more interesting stuff. I'm not going to talk about polar bear, uh, although there is now a lot of research on polar bear. Uh, I will talk about small mammals, cute mammals. Usually people think they're not that interesting, but I will show you the climate is changing and it has been known for many years, also in the uh, public. And I don't like headlights like this, be worried, be very worried, but it's actually quite nice to get funding. <laughs> <laughs> so be worried and fund my projects. It's not surprising the climate is changing because it has been changing for 2.6 million years. So here is the last 800,000 years. And you see that the climate changed on really uh, cycles on a regular base. We are here in this area. So it wasn't too surprising, although there's a quite big change. So future climate change is not the same as past climate change. According to the IPCC, at least the IPCC 4, I think, in 2007, they said that uh, for the period of 1990 to <coughs> 2100, uh, the temperature, the average temperature, will increase uh, by 1.4 to about 5.8 degrees, which is not that much if you consider that, uh, especially in the Younger Dryas, the temperature changed of uh, I think it was uh, about 13 degrees in 50 years. But it's still a big issue, especially for uh, ecosystems like the Arctic. And that's something that's called the Arctic amplification, is that uh, this climate change, this warming, is much stronger in the Arctic than it is in any other temperate biomes. There are two big uh, things that make it different. Is the past warming periods were associated with increased summer temperatures. Whereas uh, in current climate change and future climate change, the big issue is an increase in winter temperatures. And uh, you might think, okay, what does it matter? Summer or winter, it's getting warmer. But uh, for example, colored lemming, which I will talk about, uh, is living under the snow cover for nine months a year. So if it gets warmer in winter, there is no snow cover, there's a lot of more predation, and there's not a good area for breeding, so it's quite a big issue. And the other thing is that its current and future climate change is amplified by uh, CO2. Interestingly, uh, in all the past 2.6 million years, the CO2 concentration never exceeded 300 ppm. Nowadays, that's a little bit outdated. Sorry, it's uh, 400 already. So we passed 400 just a couple of weeks ago. So we are now even much higher than we were in the past at the really peaks. And it's expected to go up to 500 to 900 by 2100. So it's quite a big uh, amplification. The area or the time that we're interested in is basically the last 25 thousand years, this is the last glacial maximum, so the last maximum extent of the ice sheet uh, on this planet until today. Mostly on the one hand, this area comprises really drastic changes, like I said, the last glacial maximum, then you have warming, the younger trias, where it uh, went drastically down uh, within 50 years, and then the Holocene, in the time that we are currently on the other hand, it's also a very nice time to retrieve uh, samples and to retrieve ancient DNA from these samples. The two species I will work on are the colored lemming and the nearest skull bull. And uh, just a comment up front, these animals are not suicidal. <laughs> so if everyone thinks they're just jumping off the cliff to kill themselves, that's not true. It is the true lemming, and they are also not suicidal, they are stupid, but they are not suicidal. <laughs> they can actually swim. So they jump into the water when the population goes too high, they jump into the water and try to swim to other islands to colonize new areas. Sometimes the island is too far. 
<laughs> or is too much going on. The other little story uh, is uh, in Norway, you have, uh, it's quite cold, I think everyone knows that. In the Bible, the Bible says there is a, like a big insect plague, or was at some point, and in Norway everyone's like, insects, who cares, it's too cold anyway. So they changed it to a lemming plague. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and now they're scared. Okay, why did we choose uh, these small mammals? Especially the lemmings, or especially the collared lemmings, are key species of the Arctic ecosystem. They're key species in the Arctic food web. So in, if you want to say it very, yeah, tra very drastic, you can say the Arctic stands and falls with the lemming. Because the lemmings are the main prey for major predators. It's the snowy owl, the arctic fox, and the weasels, and actually also the skua. And they mainly feed on this lemming. Like over 90% of their diet is this lemming. So if the lemming gets extinct, the arctic has a major problem in the food web. So the distributions of the two species, the collared lemming, is only distributed really on the northwards part of the Eurasian Arctic, and then you also have them uh, on the other side, but the species that I worked on is the uh, Eurasian one, and it's the most northernwards distributed rodent on Earth. So it lives in areas where no other rodents actually really live, so it's quite crucial because there is nothing else to eat, or at least not that much. It had always lived in the Arctic. It expanded its way into Europe and the Pleistocene when it was really cold. But uh, nowadays, it's only distributed in the Arctic. Whereas the uh, nearest called Wall has most of its distribution actually in the southern regions, in uh, parts of China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, all these areas, and only part living in the Arctic. And there's actually quite big genetic difference between those. One thing that makes them really interesting is that it seems that they colonized the Arctic after the last glacial maximum. So they weren't present at the last glacial maximum, although they like it really cold and dry, but uh, they aren't as specialized to really cold and really dry climate as the colored lemming who stayed in this region through the whole, I don't know how many hundred thousand years in the past. So the interesting thing is why I choose these two is they both adapted to cold climate, but one is more of a specialist for cold and dry, one is more cold and can go into wet areas too, and also this one stayed in the Arctic all the time and this one colonized the Arctic after the last glacial maximum. They live in the same environment but they eat different things, so there's a little bit of ecological difference. The areas that I sampled and uh, if you don't see that, that's my graphic uh, reconstruction of the Ural Mountains. We mostly sampled this area here, which is an amazing cave because it has uh, sites layers for the past 25,000 years. So we really can trace populations through time from just one site. We included a few from this area here uh, for the lemmings mostly to study uh, <coughs> migration to see if we can find any signs of migration and for the wall we also included mid and south world to see if uh, there is a, a big change along the Ural mountains but for the temporal analysis we only use this one because this one is quite different okay so the first thing we did is a temporal network and just to give you an idea how it works is all these colored ellipses here are haplotypes so it's genetic sequences. If two ellipses are combined by just a line, that means there is one mutation in between the two. If there are further dots, like here, that means additional mutations. So in this case, two dots means there are three mutations between those. <coughs> ellipses that are really small and white means they were sampled in the overall sample, but not at this time point. So this one is actually this one, but we didn't find it at 11, uh, 500 years. And then 
if the haplotype is shared over time, so it stays the same, we find the same haplotype over time, it's connected by these uh, vertical lines. So we were able to find this one in all of the 25,000 years, in all the four layers, which in itself is quite a good uh, indication that there wasn't any strong turnover or anything along the way. And then we have 25,000 years, 15, 11, and present. What you, if you just look at it, you see there's a lot of genetic diversity at 25, still a lot at 15, and suddenly something happened. Between 15 and 11, they lost a lot of uh, diversity. They have an influx of very close haplotypes, and we think that's mostly due to a little bit of a higher migration between really uh, close areas because they tend, and that's a really cool evolutionary mechanism, they tend to migrate on a higher rate if the threshold, the population threshold, goes under a certain threshold, uh, under a certain value. So if the population is low, they migrate on a higher rate and thus artificially increase the genetic diversity of populations, which I think is really cool. And then if you go further uh, to the present, there's even less. So, but just looking at it, we can say, okay, something drastically happened. Some bottleneck maybe happened at around here. Whereas if you look at the, the Neuroscope wall, there's not a lot of change. So I would, I would say, being conservative, that's pretty constant. Which is interesting, because it's also, we call it adapted species. And if you remember the climate change quite drastically. So we used uh, model-based approaches uh, I don't know if you know the patient skyline plot, we'll show it, and I used the approximate patient computation. I didn't include uh, the basics of these methods. If anyone wants to know, I can show two slides. But otherwise, I just go ahead and show a colorful figure instead. So this is the patient skyline plot, just to give you an overall idea. This is the time that we have. This year's last glacial maximum, this is the berlin allered warming event, so this is climate temperature here, and this is the Holocene here, this area. And then we have effective population size here of the collared lemming, here of the narrow skull wall. And what the patient skyline plot does is basically shows how the genetic diversity, how the effective population size changes over time. And in the lemming we found that they stayed pretty constant for the last yeah, until the almost the end of uh, the beginning. Let me think the end it goes that way uh, of the last glacial maximum, and then they suddenly had a very very strong uh, bottleneck. If you look at the climate, and it usually doesn't correlate it nicely. In our case, it does. The area of the strong bottleneck is exactly the area where you have the first increase of temperature, the boiling allurid warming event. And also, if you take it a little bit broader, the increase in temperature and humidity at the Holocene, or the Pleistocene Holocene border, which I think is pretty interesting. This increase here again, I think it's, or we think it's uh, mostly to the migration. I would expect a bottleneck here, but uh, our last sample is here, and then here, and we lost most of the information along the way, if you remember that. Uh, haplotype network, so you see the confidence intervals are pretty broad, so we basically don't have the power to say anything for this period, really. <coughs> for the uh, narrow skull wall, the picture is quite different. It Overall, it stays mostly constant, and we have some indication of an increase in population size, which actually corresponds with the uh, colonization of the Arctic. So that was exactly the time they started colonizing the northern Eurasian areas. Although this one is not a very strong one. So uh, we did a base factor test with a constant size. We couldn't really say that it's much better than a constant size. In the ABC analysis, it comes out a little bit better. So we think, since it makes biological sense, that it is a signal, but it's not a very strong one. So you see there's quite a big difference between the two. I don't want to bore you with uh, my ABC, but basically what you see here is probability distributions. Here is the bottleneck timing, and you see that the bottleneck timing 
again with the ABC analysis corresponds to this building other rate warming or uh, the Pleistocene Holocene transition and also the effective population size before and after they are pretty similar to the results we got from the Bayesian Skyline plot which is actually quite nice because they are both are based on coalescent but both have really different ways of inferring things so it's kind of a almost independent method to see uh, test your hypothesis and we found the same thing uh, for the narrow skull wall where this is the timing we see that the increase in time roughly corresponds with uh, the last glacial uh, maximum okay so we said okay we have some good indications of uh, genetics but let's get a little bit further what do we know we have some indication of abundance data but abundance data of fossil remains are a little bit problematic because they were brought in by predators usually uh, snowy owls or others so it could also mimic changes in the predator rather than the prey so what we did is we used ecological niche modeling some people call it spatial distribution modeling I hate the term because it doesn't have anything to do with distribution nothing at all ecological niche modeling just tells you where you would have uh, a possible niche for this uh, mammal whatever human arthropod to live in okay so we say like let's say here we have this area here which is a potential living place but there aren't we know in modern days here the lemming that there aren't any lemmings here or there aren't any lemmings there there are different factors that could contribute on the one hand just history on the other hand uh, things like competition maybe you had more true lemmings here and so the colored lemming couldn't colonize the area for example interesting thing so basically if you never worked with ecological niche model what you do is you have your uh, current distribution so we have about uh, in this case 70 GPS dates we had way more but we did a clean out so that we have a quite nice uh, distribution all over the non-modern distribution of the species and there aren't too many of one side which can bias our inferences and what you basically do is you take a climate layer which is basically can be temperature maximum temperature in summer could be the amount of rainfall could be anything you could even which is the problem in here which we didn't do because we didn't have the information you could put in vegetation for example which would be I think very exciting and then you basically see which factors correlate with the uh, or which factors do we see in all of the modern day distribution which ones are the ones that are really important for these species and uh, for the colored lemming we found that it's uh, really the uh, how dry and wet so the humidity that is really strong the rainfall is really strong and the temperature is really strong and then you can either back cast it if you have a paleo climate layer or you can forecast it into the future with the IPCC uh, future climate data this is IPCC 4 which is the current one but I think they will release uh, 5 pretty soon so we try to get it out before <laughs> otherwise we have to redo everything this white one here is the extent of the ice sheet we know that it's not true it was the only ice layer that we could get uh, we know that this area here wasn't covered by ice or at least there are good paleontological indication that it wasn't it also makes sense because we have samples from here and the lemmings like snow but they don't like three kilometers of ice <laughs> So, but at least uh, you can see the rough extent of the ice sheet. What you can overall see is that they had living conditions all over Eurasia. So they were distributed in Europe, even a little bit further, and you can see that area where they live today, and also the further south areas. And then, if you go from the last glacial maximum to today, you see that they lost a lot of possible places almost all of Europe and then all these areas here we estimated the change roughly to be 
if I remember correctly, 80%. So they lost 80% of the possible uh, niche, of the fundamental niche. And then if you predict even further in time, and this is just a very, very liberal, it's not a very strict uh, climate layer that we used, you see that it's even further reduced to about 9% of what they had here. So this is a quite strong change, and that's what we see in the genetics. We see a drastic change between here and here. So it's a quite good idea. We know from the genetics, from the paleontological data, how they react. We know it correlates with our ecological niche modeling, so it, to some extent, makes our predictions in the future more interesting, more reliable, because we know how the niche changes, and we can then somehow correlate or get a better idea how the genetics and the uh, overall uh, dynamics will change. We did the same for the uh, colored lemming. And what you see on a very easy glimpse is that it stays almost constant. There's even a little bit more. This here is uh, that you can see anything here is just the method that we used to force it uh, to be in the, in the modern distribution to make our inferences here and here more reliable. The only problem I have to point out is that we don't have any predictions for ecological niches in Europe and we know they were living in Europe. So that's a little bit of a drawback here. In general, the dark areas are really strict thresholds and the light ones are very liberal thresholds. <coughs> so overall, we can see the same. From the last collation maximum to modern, they even expanded a little bit. And then we see, which is actually the same signal that we get with the genetics. And then we see that if you project uh, it into the future, they start losing a uh, little bit of areas. One thing that you cannot see in here is we have this northern species here that is more adapted to cold climate than the other ones. So they will have a problem because they and the colored lemmings will run into something that is called the Arctic squeeze. Is it gets warmer and warmer. So people or <coughs> mammals and, and all the animals that are adapted to cold climate move northwards, but they're already living on the edge of Eurasia. So there isn't a lot of places they can go further north. So they get kind of squeezed between the sea and the moving climate uh, increasing temperature. And what we think is, will be that the northern ones get more and more uh, squeezed, but the southern ones might be able to colonize the areas that the modern ones were living in if the temperature increases. Any questions about that so far? If you have any questions, just interrupt. The second and last uh, example, short example that I will give is uh, about shrews. Shrews are pretty cute, pretty small. It's uh, the smallest or one of the smallest mammal on Earth. It's very, very active. It almost doesn't sleep at all. Uh, and surprisingly, it's living in pretty cold areas. The other feature of, of shrews is that uh, it actually is known to be very, very uh, plasticic. There's a quite high range of, of, range of uh, sizes and morphology. So there are a lot of studies that have been done on the size change, and some say it's uh, Bergman's rule, some say it's not Bergman's rule, it follows exactly the other direction, things like that. So what we were interested in is of the shrews that live in Central Europe, are those uh, actually extinct Pleistocene species? They have been described as a much bigger, a uh, little bit different morphology. But we think, we thought, okay, no, we don't think. We think it's basically just a kind of adaptation to a different environment rather than really a different species. So an eco -morph or morphotype, if you want to say. And uh, we investigated this two fellows here, they're usually not cannibalistic, so <laughs> they're still cute. <laughs> they usually eat uh, uh, lots of, of worms, and since they're really active, they need a lot of food. And uh, so for these guys, one thing that we found is, or what we 
um, indication of is that uh, the size is correlated with, with the food uh, availability. What we did is we did uh, ancient DNA analysis, and this is just a, a discriminant analysis of principal components. You can, uh, what it basically does is uh, you have your samples and it clusters the ones that are closely related. And so what we see here, this is our ancient species, this is the modern day common true, and that's actually what we saw. We saw it's just bigger, but it's nothing else than just a common true. And again, what we saw would happen, which is I think very exciting, is that uh, the other ancient species cluster with uh, Sorex tundrensis, and as the name says, it's a tundra shrew. It's only living in the uh, in Siberia today, it's living in the southern Arctic regions, so it's very adapted to tundra cold environment. And it's one of those species, which I think is really fascinating, that colonized Europe during the Pleistocene when it was really, really cold. They followed the mammoth steppe and the tundra like environment and then went extinct into in Europe and even most parts of or the western parts of, of Russia after. Uh, the temperature increased. We also did uh, like some haplotype network. Basically, the message is uh, this is modern, this is ancient, this is again mod uh, ancient modern. This is Sorex araneus, Sorex tundrains is what we found is that there is not a lot of uh, haplotype shared between the two, but they fall within the modern day variation. So that's just a, another indication. An interesting thing is actually the morphology. So what we did is we measured lots of different things. In the end, we decided to use these two. They're commonly used. It's uh, the length of the mandible and the height of the coronoid, and then plotted it against each other. What you see is uh, the blue one is uh, the samples from what we think the time of the Berlin Alarid warming. So if you remember, it was this first warming event after the last glacial maximum before the Holocene. So we thought, okay, maybe it's warm climate that they are after. These guys here and all the green ones here are in the Younger Dryas when it was really, really cold. Okay, something is weird going on. So the red ones are modern ones. So we said <coughs> maybe just the ancient ones were bigger than the modern ones. And then we included the black ones which are about 50 to 60,000 years old, so the MIS-3, I think, where it was cold. So we have cold, and they're really small. We have cold, and they're really big, and we have uh, warm, and they're really big. So something is going on. The idea, or at least the hypothesis, that we came up with is it doesn't really... The, temperature the climate per se doesn't really matter. What really matters is the environment. What you have here in this time is a heterogeneous environment. There are trees, there are grassland, there's still a little bit of tundra environment in it, but it's very heterogeneous. In here, although the temperature really drastically stopped, or changed, there wasn't a lot of change in the vegetation. There's been a lot of work on, on distributions of uh, Pleistocene deer and also ancient DNA of plants that found that uh, trees were distributed even in, in the more southern parts of Europe still, although it was really cold. So a lot of change in the temperature, but not a lot of change in the environment. It was still heterogeneous. In this area, also very important, you have these non-analog faunas. Usually, if the faunas are pretty cold. You have either cold adapted or warm adapted. And in these areas, you find uh, layers where you have both. And it can't really work. And then in the black ones here, it's pretty cold, but it's just a steppen environment. So there's lots of grass, not many trees. And that's why they're small. On the one hand, there isn't a lot of cover. On the other hand, there aren't that many food resources, because it's really just a homogeneous steppe environment. Or at least that's what we think. So, overall, uh, what we conclude is that this non-analog heterogeneous environment was favorable for a bigger size. And uh, 
that uh, homogeneous environment like we have at the MIS-3 was actually not and that caused a smaller size. We did again some ecological niche modeling which gave some very interesting uh, insights. Again, blue is last glacial maximum, green is modern, should have switched it. This is Sorex Arrhenius, the common shrew, and this is the tundra shrew. Uh, what we see is that given the strict threshold, we see that the uh, common shrew was distributed all over Europe during the last glacial maximum and then expanded its niche towards uh, the eastern part of Russia. And for the tundra shrew, one thing is interesting, we only find uh, them in Europe if you lose a very, uh, use a really low threshold. One thing that we think is since they were much bigger and there must have been some other ecological changes, we think that it might have just used a different niche. So that the niche they use today isn't really the same as they used uh, during the last collation maximum, which is not that much uh, of a surprise given that this was very, very different to what we have today, even in the Arctic areas. This one is quite different. So again, I think there's a quite nice example, not just doing the genetics, but seeing how they actually also morphologically changed uh, due to climate and especially environmental change. And that's the end of my talk. So <laughs> any questions? So it's, it's after one, so I know some people are going to have to run to classes or other meetings, but we'll allow some people to uh, to march out and then we'll take questions just after a moment. Uh, Subfossil remains are usually preserved in the soil, so they're preserved by temperature, preserved by pH and everything. Whereas modern samples are treated, they're tried, they're put in formally, and they're put in ethanol, or they're just painted over all these things, the chemicals and all these uh, actually make it more difficult and in some cases impossible to retrieve. So it's nothing uh, about the actual bone, it's no. human intervention. Yes, okay. that's a big difference. Any other? Yep. So I have a question. So you, the Bayesian skyline plots you showed, mm -hmm. um, I mean, most people don't actually have the the, uh, the fossil material to include in their analysis. So I'm just curious if you ran similar analyses using just the modern material and whether you could make it either of those inferences based on the on the modern data alone. It's, uh, it's pretty different between these two. Uh, if you go back in time, you can get this expansion signal. Just using the modern so this samples? Is just using the modern, you can get. The timing might be uh, a little bit more inaccurate, but you can get. The problem here is that we have another signal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you go just back in time, you will pick up this one, and then it will stay probably that way, and not uh, go up. Because okay. mm -hmm. you need the temporal sampling. We have sampling here, mm -hmm. here. So it's this two sampling that we can actually really infer that the older the more precise changes. And have you actually done that analysis, or you're just you're just you think that that's how it would come out? Uh, we have, have done it with a little bit different samples, not with this one. Mm. So I don't know. Maybe it comes up with a little bit, but in general, uh, studies that have been done show that uh, this temporal sampling helps you on the one hand very very strongly with the timing, because it puts it into a, a context and also to some extent uh, the serenity of effects like you can pick up a bottleneck but it's probably you don't know if it's when it's uh, a cord or how strong it was you can still use just modern dna so we use for the polynesian stuff we have uh, modern humans and we actually see the uh, signal on some samples where they colonized the island and then expanded the genetic diversity over time so you can but including temporal sampling makes it more, you can infer more and more precisely. That's the big difference. And those analyses, they were just mitochondrial DNA? Yes. Yeah. And not complete ones. Right. So 
even with a little bit less data. In general, if you make the fragments longer, you get more information. So you can do that. And just a, a general comment, usually what we use is uh, between 20 and 30 individuals per time point. If you have 20 here or 100, doesn't really matter that much. If you have five or 20, really matters. So usually you say a minimum of about 20. There's not much significance gain afterwards. Additional questions? All right, let's right. thank Steph.